Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight, and my thanks to the WM Society for inviting me. I would like to propose that before I start, that we stand for a minute's silence in solidarity with the people of Ukraine against Russian imperialist aggression. So if you're agreeable, let's please stand for a minute's silence. Thank you very much. The title of tonight's talk is Free Speech versus Cancel Culture. And I want to begin by telling you a personal story of my experience. I got a taste of the free speech wars that exist in some university campuses back in 2016 at Canterbury Christ Church University. I'd been invited to speak on an LGBT plus panel alongside other activists, including Fran Cowley, who was, who was at the time the National Union of Students LGBT plus officer. So it was set up as a panel discussion with her, me and others. However, Fran Cowley refused to debate if I was on the platform. Now, I don't want to speculate about her motives, but some people certainly interpreted her action as a de facto ultimatum. Choose him or me. Um, in other words, her tactic looked like a bid to get me disinvited and effectively no platforms by the university. Um, I was very perplexed by her refusal. Because after all, if she'd come to the panel, she could have expressed her opposition to things I've allegedly said or done. Um, but I defended her right to not participate. I said it's perfectly right. If she doesn't want to attend, I accept that. That's fine. I'm still going to attend and speak. Um, eventually... After some pressing, I was informed about her reason for not participating. Um, she claimed, I hasten to add without any evidence whatsoever, that I was racist and transphobic. And therefore, I should not be on the panel and she would not speak alongside me. Now, this is very typical of the kinds of smears that are thrown around by some people against people they disagree with. Instead of arguing to why they're wrong or showing why they're wrong, they make these generalized, unsubstantiated claims that people are X, Y, and Z. Um, when you can't win an argument by debate, <coughs> there are some people who think that just throwing out a smear of someone's a racist, uh, Islamophobe, an anti-Semite, a homophobe, a transphobe, they think that's fair game. And so when I heard this, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll email Fran Crowley and ask her. So I, I sort of I wrote a very friendly email to Fran Crowley, uh, seeking a dialogue. You know, I said, you know, I'm very sorry you're not attending, but I entirely respect your view. I was wondering what the reasons were, because at that stage, she hadn't said directly why she wasn't prepared to share a panel with me. So um, I did ask her, you know, 
I said, well, you know, I've been informed by Christ Church uh, University that you've said I'm transphobic and racist. Um, could you please provide the evidence of that claim? Because I don't think I am. But I'm very happy, if you have evidence that I've been racist or transphobic, I'm very happy I will address it. And if I have been guilty, I will, of course, um, make an abject apology. Um, but what her response was, was to block my emails. So then I wrote to other members of the National <coughs> Union of Students LGBT plus organization to ask them, you know, why it was thought or assumed that I was racist or transphobic. Um, this was an obvious thing for me because it was a complete pub publication and I wanted to give them a chance to perhaps row back or perhaps qualify the allegation. Um, so the upshot was that she didn't reply and the other students from the same NUS LGBT rights group, they didn't reply either, at least not initially. Um, what had also transpired, according to the university, was that Fran Cowling claimed in an email to the university that by not speaking alongside me, she was acting on behalf of the NUS, quote, membership, who, quote, believe me to be racist and transphobic. <coughs> so here we are, the allegation was being made, and now it's claimed the membership, 100,000 or whatever membership of the National Union of Students had taken the decision that I should not be uh, associated with because of my racism and transphobia. So I wrote to the National Union of Students and asked, when was this decision taken by the membership? When did they discuss and vote that I should not be on a panel or that they would not be on a panel if I was there? Um, and if the decision had been taken, why was it that I wasn't informed about this decision and given an opportunity to defend myself and present my side of the case? Um, the long and the short of it was that they eventually admitted that NUS members had never decided against me. Now, this claim that Fran Cowling was acting on behalf of the membership was complete and total fiction. So, at this point, I discovered that Fran Cowling was not only making these allegations to Christ Church University, but to lots of other people as well. You know, by this time, it had got out in US circles that I was objecting to the claims made against me, and she was repeating the claims that I was racist and transphobic. Um, so, because my private overtures to her were blocked, and because eventually even the other officers of the National Union of Students refused to dialogue with me, I then went public to criticise her baseless slurs. Not just, of course, for my sake, but hopefully deter her and others from making similar false allegations against other people. I thought, this isn't just about me, this is about the integrity of the National Union of Students, an organisation which I was a member of many years ago and which I support. I did not want them to be able to get away with the idea that they could go around making allegations against people for which there was no factual basis. Um, Fran Cowling and her allies at the NUS then went on the counter-attack. They claimed that the three very polite, courteous emails I sent were harassment, were abusive, were threatening and intimidating, and that I had bullied her and outed her, outed her as a lesbian. Now, hang on. She'd been out as a lesbian for many, many years. She was also the National Union of Students LGBT plus officer. So by holding that post, she was indicating that she was, herself, LGBT. 
So um, I was very surprised and um, <coughs> somewhat alarmed that she would further make false allegations. I did a bit of research and found that, in fact, she had outed herself to the media many years before, <coughs> giving interviews that she was an out and proud lesbian. Um, so that struck me as very, very, very strange and further evidence that was right for me to challenge. Um, in the end, Fran Cowling and her allies then went as far as to say that I had ruined her life, that I had been guilty of the most grotesque abuse, threats, intimidation and harassment. I mean, complete and total nonsense. Um, and then they played up that she was a vulnerable young woman. Well, hang on, I looked at her history. She was very feisty and she did, said lots of very provocative, confrontational things, which I entirely agreed with. So the idea she was vulnerable and uh, this was just complete nonsense. So when I challenged again over these further exaggerations and lies, um, I was told I was, quote, playing establishment politics. To ask for the truth, to challenge a lie is, quote, playing establishment politics. And that I was using the challenge as a way of deflecting her criticisms that I was racist and transphobic. That I had got this whole thing up in order to push attention away from the claims that I was a racist and a transphobe. Eventually, people began pressing, some people began pressing, and it transpires that because I had campaigned against the Zimbabwean dictator, Robert Mugabe, <coughs> who murdered more black Africans than even the evil apartheid regime in South Africa, that that was proof that I was a racist. He was black, I was white, you are an effing racist, they said. And then they also said, you conducted a campaign against Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers. These were eight Jamaican singers who in the 1990s, the early part of the century, put out records openly advocating the murder, the murder of LGBT plus people. They were saying LGBT should be shot, hanged, drowned, etc. These were incitements to murder, which is a criminal offence in Jamaica, Britain, and every country in the world. But they said, this is proof you're a racist. You're white, you're targeting black singers, you are trying to destroy black music. <coughs> there were lots of other Jamaican reggae singers we didn't target because they were inciting murder. Anyway, that's the way the argument played out. Uh, as for the allegation of transphobia, that was apparently because I had signed a letter to the Observer which in no way criticised trans people, in no way said their rights should be diminished in any way, did not deny their existence as trans people, but said that the violent, intimidatory tactics of some trans allies and supporters against those who are trans critical <coughs> was wrong. You know, I do not support political violence. You know, I'm a non-violent campaigner. I do not agree with transphobes. I think they should be challenged and protested against, but I don't think they should be threatened and subjected to intimidation and actual violent physical attacks, which did happen. So that was then, sign this letter was proof you must be transphobic because you are defending people who have been subjected to violent assault and threats. I mean, this is the logic of the madhouse. But it is very indicative of the way in which some student and other politics is going and has gone. Um, that letter to the Observer was a simple defence of free speech. It was definitely not an endorsement in any way of transphobia, which I have opposed for over five decades. You know, back in the early 1970s, there weren't many people 
trans or non-trans, defending and campaigning for trans rights. But I was one of them. I wasn't the only one, but I was one. And I can remember supporting trans women who'd been evicted from a cafe in Piccadilly Circus because they were trans. I and others rallied to support them. Uh, when April Ashley was having her battles um, in the early days of the new gay liberation movement in the late 60s, early 70s, I was one of the very few people publicly defending her. Now, I'm not saying that to boast or brag, just to say that my record on trans rights may not be as good as it should be, but it's pretty strong. And certainly much stronger than that of many, if not all, of my critics. <coughs> now, when it comes to trans rights, Here's another example where we see free speech under attack. I do not agree with Kathleen Stock at Sussex University. I think that her views on trans rights, or the situation of trans women in particular, is wrong. But I don't agree with her being subjected to violent threats <coughs> and intimidation. I do support the peaceful protest against her, and to her credit, even she said she accepted the right of students to protest peacefully against her. But I do disagree with those who were making her live in fear. Now, challenging her is fine. Maybe even robust criticism is fine. Calling her out as a trans critic or transphobe, that is fine, that's legitimate, whether you agree or not. But, you know, terrorising her with people wearing balaclava masks, threatening to attack her home, I think that's a step too far. The way to deal with Kathleen Stock is to argue and show why her views are wrong, not to force her out. Now, Kathleen Stock herself <coughs> has given a rather jaundiced view of why she left Sussex University. She said that she was being forced out. Well, first of all, no disciplinary proceedings were taken against her. She was not sacked. She said she didn't get the support of her union. But I've seen the resolution <coughs> passed by her union, the UCU, in which they say they oppose disciplinary action being taken against her. They say, we don't agree with Kathleen Stock's views, but we don't agree that she should face disciplinary action. So, there's an example where, again, the facts, the, the, the actual sequence of events, what actually happened, has been somewhat, you know, bent and manipulated. Um, J.K. Rowling. You know, again, I do not agree with her views. Uh, J.K. Rowling and Kathleen Stock both produce a narrative which suggests that trans women are a threat to other women. This is the old, what I call the predator trope. The idea that all trans women are men who are predators out to rape and abuse women. That is a monstrous generalisation. <coughs> of course, there have been a handful of trans women who have done bad things. And I totally condemn that. They should be excluded from women's places. But that is not the experience of most trans women in this country. Their behaviour has been absolutely exemplary. They've been using women's toilets for decades. There's never been a problem. I know women who work in women's centres around the country where those women's centres have accepted trans women by a vote of the staff and the users. In all the years, there's never been a problem. What they do is they vet all women who use the centre. Because obviously women's safety is an issue. I totally get that. You know, I agree with women's campaigners who say we have to protect women from predators. But I don't agree that they then demonise all trans women as predators. And nor do I agree with the idea that it's just trans women who are a threat. Most women-on-women -women violence is not perpetrated by trans women. It's perpetrated by other biological women. So... This is why I agree with protests against Stock, Kathleen Stock, against protests against J. 
J.K. Rowling. But I don't believe that it's right to misrepresent them, which has happened sometimes, as wanting to take away trans human rights, that the trans people should somehow lose their right to exist. Um, you know, you could say that the arguments of Kathleen Stock and J.K. Rowling do imply that they are denying trans identity. That is certainly true. But they're not saying that trans people should be discriminated against, that they should be targeted for hate crime, and so on. This is basically an issue around women's spaces. Should trans women be kept out of women's spaces, like women's centres and refuges, women's rape crisis centres, and so on? There's been another case um, at Bristol University where a PhD student, Raquel Rosario Sanchez, has been subjected to intimidation, threats, and harassment by other students because she supports a trans critical organization. Now, again, I don't agree with her, and I'm concerned about some of the things she said, but what is really, really frustrating is that no one is reporting precisely what she said. They're saying she's a transphobe. They're saying she supports women's place. But they've never actually said what she's actually said. As far as I know, I've never seen any evidence she suggested that trans women should be, um, you know, beaten up or be denied jobs or so on. I've never seen that. But it does appear that she has been subjected to a campaign of harassment and intimidation. What precisely that entails, I don't know. Because no one, not the university, not her, not the press, none of them have said precisely what this intimidation and harassment involved. So it would be perfectly proper and right for students who disagree with her to stand outside her class or to challenge her on the university campus as to why she's supporting women's place. That'd be perfectly legitimate. That, that's not intimidation. It's like if someone came in the door tonight and started you know, shouting and yelling at me and disagreeing with me, I wouldn't call that intimidation or, or threats. I'd just say, well, you know, you're entitled to your point of view. Come here, I'll give you five minutes. You can speak your mind and we'll hear what you have to say. So with all these issues, it's really difficult to know precisely what degree of harassment and intimidation is taking place. Um, Certainly, if it involved, you know, pushing and shoving her, that would be totally unacceptable. But if it was just a protest, standing in front of her with placards and saying, why are you supporting this organisation that demonises trans women, that is legitimate, peaceful protest. So, there's just a little example of how the line between free speech, in terms of legitimate protest and views, and speech that oversteps the line, it is not clear, and I think sometimes it certainly is being uh, violated. I say all this because what I'm really trying to get to is the idea that these examples are symptomatic of the pressure on free speech today. And I think that certainly in some university campuses, not all by a long shot, but some, the openness for free debate, for the free exchange of ideas for challenge and counter-challenge is diminished. You know, some universities don't want to hold debates because they're afraid of the consequences. You know, they're intimidated by one side or the other into silence. So, for example, I can't recall, you may, may, maybe you can correct me, but I can't recall any university having a debate about trans rights where trans critics and trans women are able to debate. I do know lots of universities and other associations that have refused to have this debate because they're afraid of the consequences. And that really is scary. The idea that this subject should be off limits, that is completely against the, the principles and values of a free, open, liberal, democratic society. I think that to marginalise and defeat critics, there is an increasing resort to 
deliberately false damaging allegations like the ones I described against me. And I'll come back to that later, give you some examples of people I personally know who have been accused of all kinds of things which are totally untrue. The critics of those people haven't got the arguments, the evidence, to win their case, so they resort to these smears and slurs. And smears and slurs which palpably have no evidence to back and validate them. Now, I think it also needs to be said that the prevalence of such tactics has been exaggerated by some right-wing commentators. You know, you look at the Spectator and the Telegraph, you would think that there was, there was no open free debate anymore in any British university. You would think that people are being witch-hunted left, right and centre. Now, the fact that this sort of atmosphere exists where there is some challenge or diminution of free speech, but also an exaggeration of it for political ends, is very worrying. Um, I think it, certainly in the university context, is a very worrying sign. Back when I did my degree in the mid-1970s, yeah, we had robust debate. And sometimes we did boycott speakers, Sometimes we did, you know, make a lot of noise during debates with particularly far-right extremist, racist speakers. Um, but by and large, the debates happened because we were confident that we had arguments and evidence to show why these <coughs> extremists were wrong. Um, I am now and was then a very passionate defender of free speech. And I think it's particularly in universities that these should be places where ideas are considered, debated, and challenged. Uh, as a basic fundamental rule, bad ideas are most effectively debunked by good ideas. You know, if you can't, if there's an idea that is fundamentally flawed, the way to defeat it is not by bans or prescriptions, but by showing why it's wrong. Showing the evidence, producing the research to show why it's wrong. I think, you know, evidence, logic, ethics are best rather than crude bans or censorship. And there's also an issue about the use or abuse of the law. You may be familiar of the many instances of Christian street preachers who've been arrested for holding up signs saying homosexuality is sinful. They weren't threatening the LGBT plus community. They weren't using inflammatory language. They were just expressing an opinion. An opinion that I find wrong, and I'm disappointed to hear expressed, but it was their opinion. <coughs> and in a democratic free society, people have a right to an opinion, even if it's misguided, and even if it is, to some degree, offensive. So, I, in contrast to most LGBT people, I've actually said, these street preachers should not be prosecuted. That is a step too far. They weren't harassing or threatening anybody, they were just holding up a sign or expressing an opinion. I even, in a couple of cases, offered to act as a defence witness for these street preachers, but they were so homophobic, they didn't want me. <laughs> um, it is, I think, really a step too far to criminalise opinions merely because they are disagreeable and even offensive. Um, I think that we need to have a latitude. And I say this as someone who in the 1960s, a lot of the ideas that I expressed were deemed as offensive, and I was banned. I was no platformed, defending LGBT plus rights, uh, campaigning for the rights of working class people and trade unions, um, doing direct action, non-violent direct action to challenge homophobes, racists, anti-Semites, and so on. I was blackballed. So I know what it's like. I don't think the left should adopt right-wing tactics. Because that's what basically bans and prescriptions have historically been in this country. 
I think now it's interesting that it's sort of flipped. It's more often the left that's in favour of bans and prescriptions than the right. Although the right still does use it, and I'm sure you remember how all those Tory Remain MPs in the Cabinet were forced out after the Brexit vote. They were cancelled because they supported Remain. So it isn't just an exclusive left or right thing. Now, going back to university no platform policies and safe space policies, I think they usually have very honourable intentions. I think the purpose of these policies is good. Um, the idea is to make sure that perhaps less confident people, perhaps marginal people, have an opportunity to speak. That it isn't just the super well-educated, confident people, middle-class people, who get to dominate all the debates. That's fine. And of course, we don't want black and ethnic minority people to be in a university where racists are, are, are able to say, go back to your own country, where they can have sort of swastikas and Ku Klux Klan insignia um, painted on their dormitory doors. That is unacceptable. We have to stop that. Um, so the, the purpose, I think, is in principle fine. The problem is the interpretation and enforcement. Um, sometimes the no platform policy or the safe space policy goes way beyond the original intention. You know, the interpretation and enforcement is much wider than was originally intended or justified. And it does mean that sometimes free speech and open debate is inhibited. Now, having said that, I just want to emphasize that free speech does not mean that you allow bigoted ideas to pass unchallenged. So, of course, racism or misogyny or homophobia, when you hear it, you should call it out. You know, if an organization's behind it, they should be challenged. There should be counter-protests. Um, it's not about saying free speech with no restrictions. Free speech with some restrictions, which I'll come on to shortly, but also, most importantly, the right, indeed the duty, to protest against them. So when Germaine Greer had an attempt to prevent her from speaking at Cambridge University, over her comments about trans women, I totally disagreed with what she was saying. But I also defended her right to speak and be challenged. Speak and be challenged. I supported the protests outside the Cambridge Union. So I wasn't just washing my hands and saying, oh, let Jermaine Greer get on with it. I said, challenge her, confront her, refute what she's saying, protest against her. All the evidence throughout history is that the most effective way to challenge bigoted ideas is by exposing them in open debate and thereby helping to change public opinion. Now, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, when it was not popular to advance LGBT plus rights, I accepted every invitation to speak on radio and TV and to write newspaper columns making the case for LGBT plus liberation and equality. And that included debating some sometimes awful, dreadful homophobes. You know, there were elected Conservative Party officials who in the 1980s said things like that all gay people should be locked up, should be quarantined, should be gassed. Unbelievable stuff. A lot of people said, don't debate those bigots. And I said, no, no, no. We should debate them to show why they're wrong, to expose their prejudice and bigotry. And of course, I had no expectation that I would persuade them, because they were so hardcore. But I knew there was an audience. So there used to be a program, a late night program on Channel 4, I think it was, called Dial Midnight. I ran that program with some awful homophobes, but it had over a million people watching. And I was able to get and explain the ideas of LGBT plus equality to that audience of a million plus people. And that is how we change public opinion. 
we change public opinion by going up against those bigots to show why they were wrong. Now, today, there are a lot of people say, oh, we don't debate bigots. So in the trans debate, it is very difficult to get any trans person to debate against the transphobes. I respect their decision. I understand why they take that decision. But it's fundamentally wrong. It's mistaken. Because what it means is that transphobes get free reign to say whatever they want without challenge. You turn on GB News, LBC, talk radio and so on, it's just completely one-sided. Because trans people are not willing to debate. And so therefore, pub the public mind has been poisoned by the trans critics. Because it's the only argument they've heard. And some of those trans critics, they're very persuasive but they can be easily debunked. And I'm just so frustrated that trans people won't step up to the plate and do that. Because I know they have got right on their side and they can win. I'm even more shocked that on the few occasions when I have stepped in to challenge transphobes, I've been denounced by people in the trans community. I made it clear I was speaking as a trans ally, I'm not trans myself. <clears throat> but I thought, I can't allow this person to speak on GB News for 20 minutes without being challenged. And when I did go and challenge them, I was denounced. I mean, this is madness. We will never win the trans debate <coughs> if we're not prepared to show why the transphobes and critics are wrong. If you have no platforms, bans and censorship, yes, it will suppress bigotry. So, you know, there have been various far right and far extreme Islamists who have been no platform. And it means they don't have an opportunity to speak. Some people might say, well, that's, that's the end of it, that's good. But the problem is, it suppresses the idea and, and denies it a public platform, but it still exists, only it's more underground, more difficult to challenge. And so <coughs> the far right have their own media channels and everything, they will still get those ideas out, and lots of non-far right people for various algorithms <coughs> on social media will pick up on those. They won't see the alternative argument. So, the ban, censorship, no platform policy, it doesn't actually refute the bad idea. Uh, less than hate needs to be said again, you know, freedom of speech is one of the most important and precious of all human rights. Throughout the ages, people have suffered greatly to defend the right of the free exchange of ideas. You know, the early Protestant leaders uh, in this country, um, you know, were subject to incredible persecution pre-Reformation by the Catholic Church. But their arguments, their ideas, even though I didn't agree with them from a religious point of view, did challenge the authority of the church and the state in a way that was broadly progressive. Um, you know, you, you look back at the way in which the charters, the suffragettes, uh, people like that were vilified and there were many many attempts to stop them from speaking so many of the charters rallies were broken up by the police or the infantry or the yeomanry to stop them speaking to stop their voice being heard so the battle for freedom of speech has been a long hard and often bloody one and we see it in many other countries today you know, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Uganda. Free speech does not exist in those countries. The tyranny of those regimes silences critics and dissenters. So, to me, one of the most fundamental things about a free and democratic society is the free exchange of ideas. Even ideas that some of us may find disagreeable.
Because, you know, what's a good idea or a bad idea is a subjective point of view. You know, I claim and believe that I'm speaking the truth and right, but of course I'm a fallible human being. I could be wrong. I like it when people challenge me. I like to hear my critics because it keeps them on my toes. Whereas a lot of people, for them, the critics are the enemy. The people must be banished, excluded, rejected, and worse. Now, some students, I've heard, justify the no platform and safe space policies in the name of not causing offence. They say, you can't say that, it's offensive. Well, let's just take a look. Some of the most important ideas in human history have caused great offence in their time such as those of Galileo Galilei, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Mary Wollstonecraft, Harriet Tubman, Sigmund Freud, just to name a few. They caused great offence in their time, particularly against the church. Now, there is no right in any human rights law to be spared offence. There's no right to not be offended whether that's on a university campus, or indeed anywhere else. <coughs> I'm a passionate supporter of women's right to choose. The idea that women should have control over their own which free speech can be legitimately restricted. And I want to talk about those. The first legitimate restriction on free speech is when someone makes false, damaging allegations allegations that could be harmful. So, for example, by putting it out that I'm a racist, could, to an ill-informed person, provoke attacks upon me or my home by those who think, because of this claim, that I'm a racist. Um, I know friends of mine who have been falsely accused of being anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim, who have been consequently physically assaulted in the street based on a false allegation that has actually caused them harm. I think people who do that forfeit their right to free speech. Falsehood and dishonesty is not part of free speech. The second instance is where a person engages in threats, menaces, intimidation or harassment. Some of you, some of you may remember the case of Caroline Cabrera Perez, who campaigned some years ago to get Jane Austen on the £10 note. A totally laudable campaign, and she succeeded. But, as a result of her campaign, she was bombarded, not by dozens or hundreds, but thousands and thousands of abusive, <coughs> threatening messages. Often from the same person. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Now, she was living in fear for her safety. She feared violent assault, attack upon her home, and so on. So there's another instance where I think people who do that, they lose the right to free speech. And the third instance is when people incite violence. When they say, you should be killed, or X should be killed, or... I wouldn't care less if so-and-so was murdered. And this has happened to me many, many, many times. When I was involved in the LGBT plus group outrage in the 1990s, we challenged lots of homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic figures. We challenged them face to face, we exposed them. In some cases, we even outed them where they were publicly anti-gay while having secret gay relationships. And Two major newspaper columnists said that I, either one said, I deserve to be killed, giving a green light, the other said, I wouldn't lose tears if Peter Thatcher was murdered. Now again, that is a step too far. You know, these are abuses of free speech. Now it's true that if people make threats, 
menaces, harassment, or incitements of violence against Jewish people, Muslim people, LGBTs, women's rights campaigners. Um, <coughs> that is not legitimate. I've always supported the no-platforming of those people. So in the 1970s, the then far-right movement, the National Front, used to march into black and Asian communities demanding they go home, <coughs> throw rocks and bottles at their windows, smash up Asian-owned shops. I said, these people should not have a right to protest. They are violent thugs. They should be banned. And I said that this organization, the National Front, should not be given a platform in universities and elsewhere. And I think that was the right decision. Because when you resort to abuse and threat, when you use intimidation, it excludes people on the receiving end. The people who are being targeted are then afraid to debate in the public square because they fear the consequences. You can't have an inclusive debate, an open debate, a generally free debate, if some of the people are being subjected to death threats and worse. Now, I agree that there are some instances, as I said, where people should be no platform. And in some instances, it's very clear that student safety in universities has been at stake. And I'll come on to that a little bit later. You know, far-right extremists, uh, anti-Semitic Islamist extremists have caused terror on some universities. They've made Jewish people, LGBTs and others, feel unsafe. This isn't just because of a few nasty words, but because it is backed by people and organisations who have a record of threats, violence and intimidation. I'll just give you an example of this. Um, I mentioned the Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers who are inciting violence against LGBT plus people. These are all from Jamaica. And at the time, when they were putting out these tracks, there was a huge spike in violent attacks upon LGBT plus people in Jamaica, including murders. People actually being murdered on the knowledge or even suspicion, even suspicion that they might be gay. So the Jamaican LGBT plus group JFLAG they wanted something done. They wanted to stand up, but they were afraid because they feared if they went on TV or radio or they organised a protest, they would be killed. And very likely they would have been. So, they were not able to participate in the public <coughs> debate. Their free speech was diminished by the atmosphere of threats intimidation and violence. So myself and others in outrage in London, we were approached by JFLAG to campaign on their behalf. So on their instructions and invitation, we campaigned from here in London to expose what these singers were saying, to show why they were wrong, to publicise to the world the horrendous, murderous lyrics these singers were putting out and which were being played on the BBC and commercial radio stations. They were playing songs, the publicly funded BBC playing songs, saying that gay people should be shot in the head. Unbelievable, it took a five year campaign to get the BBC to stop that. The police totally refused to enforce the law. This was a clear incitement to violence, a criminal offence, the police said, quote, we don't want to upset the black community. Talk about a generalisation. I mean, not all black people are homophobic, for a start. And when it comes to incitement to murder, the perpetrators should be upset, and so should their supporters. Anyway, um, we did the campaign. I got the death threats. I had to live under armed police protection for three months. I got bricks through my window. I was attacked in the street. When we did protests against these singers, we had to have armed police protection. Similarly, for many years in universities up and down the country, not all universities by a long shot, but some universities, 
far right Islamist preachers were given a platform to speak. These were people advocating the most grotesque things that women, her sex outside of marriage, should be killed. That Jews were the enemy of Muslims and every Jew must die. The LGBT plus people were sinning against Allah and they should be killed. The list went on and on and on. But they were being given platforms in publicly funded British universities. And moreover, they were demanding when they spoke that there be gender segregation. They said women are unclean and impure, they cannot be allowed to sit next to men. And the universities agreed to this. The university authorities agreed that was their legitimate free speech. In some cases they said no woman must be allowed this meeting. Women are the inferior sex. Politics and religion is for men only. And they were allowed to get away with that as well. We're only talking about 10, 15, 20 years ago. This isn't the 19th, I'm not talking about the 19th century. I'm talking about Britain in the 1990s and early part of the century. And those of us who dared challenge them were described as Islamophobes. That we were anti-Muslim bigots because we wouldn't let these extremists have their say. I'll come back to that in a minute. A 2016 survey found that 63% of UK university students supported the National Union students having a no-platform policy. So almost two-thirds said a no-platform policy was justified. But in limited circumstances. They didn't agree with a blanket no platform policy, a limited one. Um, the following year, there was a very controversial and disputed analysis published by Spiked Online magazine, which claimed that 63% or 63.5% of universities actively censored free speech, and 30.5% stifled speech to excessive regulation. Now that is pretty alarming, and everybody's you know, eyes popped and ears picked up to hear those statistics. But on closer examination, it wasn't quite like that. So for example, one university department, yes, said, we don't want to host this speaker. But the organisation was then able to get another university department to host the speaker. So the speaker was still able to speak, still able to express their point of view. Um, there was a, another bit of research, or two bits of research in 2018, one by the BBC and one by the Parliamentary Committee, Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights. They both found that yes, there was some inhibition on free speech in some universities, but they said it was exaggerated. They said these talk of you know, two-thirds having censorship was nonsense. There are some highly publicised examples, but mostly, most universities and student unions did have a no-platform policy that was very narrowly uh, enforced. So, the existing, the long-standing and still existing National Union of Students no-platform policy includes only six racist or fascist organisations. El Majorum, the British National Party, English Defence League, His Book to Hear, Muslim Public Affairs Committee, and National Action. Just six organisations. The problem is, and we always get back to problems and exceptions, is that the no-platform policy has often been more widely interpreted by some universities and some student unions and student societies. Much wider than those six. So, I think of the example of Nick Lowell's, the director of the anti-racist group Hope Not Hate. He, as well as opposing far-right extremists from the traditional white nationalist spectrum, has also spoken out against far-right Islamists who threaten Jews and even Muslims who don't conform to their particular interpretation of Islam. 
And on that basis, there was an attempt to get him disinvited to a National Union of Students event. It did not succeed, but it nearly did. And the fact that it should have been attempted in the first place shows an example of how the policy can be more widely and extremely interpreted. Another victim was my friend Mariam Namazi. She is an Iranian communist and feminist who has based her own, her own torture at the hands of the Tehran fascist regime, uh, has critiqued Islamists who advocate the killing of Jews, ex-Muslims, blasphemers, LGBT plus people, and women who have sex outside of marriage. She has said these people are wrong. She's exposed them. And some of them hide their, hide their views very well. There's an organization called the Islamic <coughs> Human Rights Commission. Sounds very, very good, an Islamic Human Rights Commission. It's been endorsed by Jeremy Corbyn, no less. But this is a pro-Iranian organization, uh, which has defended the regime in Tehran, which jails trade unionists and tortures them to boot, jails women who refuse to wear the headscarf, uh, jails and even executes LGBTs, and in particular, persecutes ethnic minority, Kurdish, Arab, and Baluch communities. So, Islamists are now getting much more clever. They cloak their extremist agenda in the language of human rights to fool people. And boy, they fool a lot of people. They fool a lot of people, <coughs> I'm sad to say. Um, as a result of Mario Namazi's views, challenging exposing these extremists, there have been attempts to ban her from some university campuses on the false grounds that she is, quote, Islamophobic, anti-Muslim. She is no such thing. She's done more to support Muslims than almost anybody else, or certainly more, more than any of her critics. When those attempts to ban her fail, um, she was shouted down by Islamist students at Goldsmith College. They claim that just by expressing and exposing the views that some Islamists were promoting about killing Jews and women and so on, they claim she was violating the safe space policy, that she was making Muslim students feel threatened and marginalised. Of course, she never said a word against Muslim students. She was highlighting extremists who are the equivalent of Nazis in their extremist views. Um, she had to battle on to speak. She did, if you've certainly seen, some of you may have seen the videos, she's battling against a, a, a barrage of hecklers, abusive and so on. And in fact, that, that video doesn't, doesn't even show the worst of it. So I think to, to wrap up, I mean, the safe space policy was never intended to censor legitimate debate. Its raison d'etre was very commendably to ensure that students, including women, racial, sexual, and gender minorities, are not victimized and are not overlooked in debates. That they can participate as much as everyone else. That it isn't just the strong, confident, you know, straight white men who get to speak all the time, but that all the diverse voice, voices are heard. But of course, it too has been subjected to excessive interpretation. So in 2016, at Edinburgh University, a young student, Immigrant Wilson, was threatened with ejection from a student meeting after she raised her hand and shook her head in disagreement with the speaker. She claimed the speaker was making false allegations against her. She simply put up her hand to speak and she shook her head when he was making false claims. It was said that her actions violated the student union's safe space policy, which prohibited, quote, gestures which denote disagreement. Can you believe it? <laughs> gestures that denote disagreement. That's prohibited. It was prohibited. Um, I'll just finish by saying, across the political spectrum, the battle for free speech 
and the right to freedom of expression is shared by many different people. Rosa Luxemburg, the German communist, argued for free debate against Lenin and the centralists of the Russian Communist Party. She said it's vital to have an open debate. And the idea that you censor opinions and you shut down people, they're not allowed to be heard, that goes against all the principles of what she said communism should be about. It should be about people being free to express themselves, among other things. John Stuart Mill, a great Scottish philosopher, he again, perhaps in the most eloquent way, expressed the importance and fundamental of free speech, as did Mahandras Gandhi, the Indian independence leader. They and many others have always argued that freedom of speech means nothing if it doesn't exist for the person who thinks differently. So I ask that students, universities, government ministers and our wider society acknowledge that free speech is vital for a free and open society and that attempts to restrict it are an attack upon human rights. Provided they do not go into the realm of inciting violence and the other exceptions I've given, we should contest those ideas and challenge them rather than ban them. Thank you.